Numbers chapter 32, it's on the screens. Are you thankful for Mickey Ledbetter and these screens? Man, I'm telling you, woo, that's awesome. Numbers chapter 32, we're just going to cut to the chase this morning. Everybody read it with me. And be sure that your sin will find you out. Everybody read that one more time. And be sure that your sin will find you out. Sin. Let's talk about sin today. It's the one thing we all have in common, but nobody seems to ever want to talk about it, right? What, what, everybody repeat this after me. God, God created, created the heavens and the earth. Do you believe that this morning? We're going to go to Sunday school, all right? God created the heavens and the earth, amen? And the Bible says that he created a garden. He made man of the dust of the earth. He formed woman out of the rib of the man. He put them in a garden. Everything was pristine. Everything was perfect. There was no sin. Man was created in a state of innocence. Say innocence. He put a tree in the middle of that garden and God spoke to the man and the woman and he said, of every tree in the garden you can have and you can eat, but don't touch that one. That one's mine. He said, every other tree in the garden you can eat of, but that one you don't even touch it. Isn't it something that God brought special attention to that one tree that they weren't supposed to touch? Isn't it something? Because here, here's the thing, folks. God so values freedom that he gives you and I the choice to choose against him. I just said a mouthful. It just went right over y'all's head. God so loves freedom that he gives you and I the choice to choose against him. Amen? Amen. And he created, and you know the story, the serpent deceived Eve. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And sin entered perfection. Sin entered the cosmos. Sin entered the garden. And the Bible says that they were banished from the garden. That man would have to work by the sweat of his brow. And that woman would have child, a pain through childbirth. And that sin entered the world. Death entered the world. Pain entered the world. Tragedy entered the world. Heartache entered the world all because of that one word, sin. Sin. Sin, it's the one thing that we all have in common. It's a communicable disease that we're all born with. And there is a remedy. Everybody say, there is a remedy. Is a remedy. And that name is what? Jesus. Amen. And here's, here's the thing, sin. Sin, the only thing that's powerful enough. Sin, the only thing that's capable enough. Sin, the only thing that can separate us from the arms of a loving and holy and righteous and powerful God. Sin is the only thing that can separate us from God. Everybody say amen. amen. I just said a whole mouthful there. But be sure, read it with me one more time. Be sure that your sin well, fine. I know you're getting, I think, you know you think you're getting away with it. I know you think that nobody knows, right? What, what, if, what if we were to get these big, big magic screens up here? What if we were to put a transcript of all of your text messages this week? What if, we, what, what if we were to put a, a, a synopsis of all of, the, of all the websites that you visited this week on these screens? Uh, I mean, you know, I, well, Brother Jason, I don't have any sin. You know, I'm perfect and I am holy and, you know, I am a righteous. Yeah, what about uh, your conversation on the way to church this morning? Right? The Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we are deceived. Amen? Amen. And that's actually in the, in the Bible. Let, let me look, look it up here real quick. It's the next scripture. Luke chapter 8, verse 17. Here, here's, here's, here's the thing. I'm sorry, 1 John. 1 John 1 eight. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Amen? The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? Luke chapter 8 verse 17. Luke chapter 8 verse 17. For nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed. 
nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Amen? God sits high. He looks low. Everybody say, God is watching. God is watching. Amen? God is watching. And, 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 and here's, here's, here's the thing. Pastor Todd, wasn't, wasn't, didn't Pastor Todd preach an awesome sermon last week? Amen. Amen. Last week, Pastor Todd, he, he, he was all over my message. He you just preached my message this week, man. But he told us, he said, there is victory in exposing the darkness. Amen. Amen. There is victory found in exposing darkness the darkness. And that's exactly what I believe God wants us to do today. We're going to expose our sin. We're going to uncover our sin. We're going to take it out of the darkness and we're going to drag it kicking and screaming into the light and we're going to stick our finger in its face under the authority and anointing of God and we're going to tell it to get out of our life once and for all. Amen? There's victory in exposing the darkness. Amen. I, I remember uh, our, our, our second oldest, Judah, he's, he's seven. He was about two years old, and he used to like to play hide and seek. And uh, he used to go run and hide, and I'd have to come find him, right? And I remember one time, Todd, he, uh, he ran in the bathroom, and he got behind the shower curtain. I couldn't see him, but when I walked in, I saw two little feet sticking out. And that's exactly the way we are with God. Hello, somebody. That's the way we are with God. Amen? Amen. We think we can hide from him. We think that he doesn't know, but he sees our feet every time. Amen? Amen. Because God, God is absolutely powerful because he's absolutely holy. He's absolutely holy because he's absolutely powerful. God is powerful because he's holy. Holiness is purity. Somebody say purity. Purity. And here's, here's the good news today. The only sin that God cannot forgive is the sin that is unrepented of. Amen? Amen? The only sin that God cannot forgive is the sin that is unrepented of. Amen. So you're going to, you're saying, well, brother Jason, that's all fine and dandy, but what does that have to do with me? And what in the world is up with that tent on the stage? (laughs) You ought to know every time you come in here on Sunday, something's going to be different, right? (laughs) Yeah, Mandy, Mandy didn't kick me out. I called Randall last night and I said, when you walk in the church this morning and you turn the lights on, you're going to see something on the stage. Don't freak out, all right? So I had to give Randall a heads up. But uh, to answer that question, we need to go to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Remember from your Sunday school days, what happened in Joshua chapter 6? The children of Israel, they crossed over the Jordan River, right? God spoke to them and said, I've given you a promised land, but you have to take it. There are people in that promised land that you must defeat in order to possess that promised land. Amen? And so in Joshua chapter number 6, they come to a a walled fortress city called Jericho. Everybody say Jericho. Jericho. Walls that were so tall they could race four chariots deep around the entire top of those walls of that city. This wasn't just a little village. This was a metropolitan point where all the commerce happened. These walls were made to detour armies and to defeat any people that would try to come and overtake the walled city of Jericho, right? So what happened? God spoke to Joshua and he said the children of Israel are to march around the city of Jericho one time every day for seven days and on the seventh day they will march around seven times. And when the children of Israel marched around that city of Jericho one day, one time each day for seven days and on the seventh day seven times around, the Bible says that they shouted with a shout and the ground opened up and swallowed those walls of Jericho. Amen? Amen. And now, Joshua chapter number 7. 
they leave Jericho. They come to a small, insignificant city called Ai. Everybody say Ai. Ai. A small, little, insignificant city when compared to Jericho should only be a, a, a small, a small campaign. And so they did what most of us do. They said, well, we won't send the entire army. We'll just go ahead and send a few men. And the Bible says that they were embarrassed and defeated, ridiculously defeated at the city of Ai. They, in fact, lost 38 men in that campaign against Ai. The, the, the nation of Israel was, was shocked at what happened. They defeated Jericho with these walls. They come to the tiny city of Ai and they're defeated. What happened? Had God turned his back on them? So Joshua went to the Lord in prayer. And God's answer to Joshua was plain. Israel had sinned. Israel had sinned. Because what happened was God gave the word to Joshua at Jericho. He said, when you march around the city, the walls will come down. Everything found in the city of Jericho is to come into the treasury of the Lord. In other words, God spoke to him and said, don't touch it. It's mine. All of the gold, all of the fine linen, all of the jewels, everything that is inside of those walls, don't touch touch it. Say that with me. Don't touch it. And so Joshua went to the Lord and God spoke to him and said, Israel had sinned because a man named Achan, everybody say Achan, a man named Achan, and he's very well apt named Achan because what happened was Achan got to Achan. The Bible says that Achan took the spoils from Jericho. The Bible says he took a finely wo woven linen. He took 200 shekels of silver and he took a wedge of gold. And what did Achan do? Achan took those things and he hid them in his tent. I don't mean to be talking about you this morning. What happens? Some of, of y'all are Achans in here. You get to Achan, right? God delivered you from alcohol, but there comes a time when you've had a rough day at work and you start aching for a drink of that smooth stuff, right? Or God delivered you from pornography, but in the middle of the night you wake up and you go back to those old ways. You get to aching for that, that thing that, that satisfies that lust, we get to aching. We get to aching. There's times that each and every one of us, we get to aching for things that we turned in and put in our past that God forgave us from, right? But that's what Achan did. He took those precious things and he hid them in his tent. And, and I'm sure that he thought about, if I'm found with these things, yes, God spoke to Joshua, said don't touch it, but if I'm found with these things, they're surely going to stone me. They're surely going to put me to death. Isn't that just like the devil? He always promises the rainbow, but all you get is the rain. He promises you everything, but you really can't enjoy it because surely if you're found out, you're going to be destroyed, right? Right? Oh, I guess I'm just talking to me this morning. We get to be like Achan. We get things hidden in our lives. We hide them in our tent, and we don't want anybody to know about. We hide them in the deepened recesses of our lives in our tent, and we, we hope that nobody will find out about those things. But 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 20, 28, it says, Let a man... Examine himself. Let a man examine himself. So this morning, we're going to take a carefully calculated moral assessment this morning. I'm going to ask you this morning, what do you have hidden in your tent? What things do you have hidden in your tent that nobody knows about? Oh, I know you look like you got it all put together. You got the perfect job. 
you got the beautiful house with the white picket fence, the two children and a dog and a boat. You've got all these different things. You've been blessed. Everybody looks at you and you've got it all put together. But everybody has something hidden in their tent. It's quiet in here today. It's quiet in here today. What's hiding in our tents? What is compromising our testimony and short-circuiting our power? I am worship. I believe God is speaking to us today and saying, when you take care of the hidden things, I will bless you openly. When you take care of these things that slip you up and short-circuit your power, then I can move in your life. Amen? I believe that where God wants to take I Am Worship Church, He can't take us there until we deal with the things that are hidden in our tents. Amen? Amen? So, so let's, let's, just, let's just take a little, let's take a little look at what we got hidden in our tents. Let, let me see here. Oh, we got a lot of stuff in here. There's hardly any room in here. We got all kinds of stuff. Ooh, yeah, I'm going to talk about that later. There's all kinds of stuff hidden in this tent. This one's heavy. Uh, this one's really heavy. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll come back. This one's really heavy. This one, man. I'm breaking a sweat, Brother Todd. This one's heavy. This one's hidden in a tent. Grudges, such a heavy thing for such a small little matter. Grudges. How many grudges have we hidden in our tent when somebody has done us wrong, when something legitimately may have happened, but we hold on to this grudge? You know what a grudge is? It's like drinking poison expecting that person to die. Come on, somebody. How many grudges, how much unforgiveness have we ever harbored in our heart against somebody? How many times, Brother Keith, has God said, I want to bless you, but you're holding on to this. And, and, and if you would just trade this for what I've got for you, you'll be blessed but we won't give it up. How many times have we held on to these things? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, say the next word. Come on, say the next word. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. God forgave us of all the mess in our life, but we can't forgive our brother and sister. Amen? Amen? In other words, you're in a prison while they're walking free. Man, I'm, I'm talking up in here. I don't know if y'all like this or not, but I'm talking. You're in a prison in your own mind while they're walking free because of this thing you refuse to let go of. It'll rob you of joy. Amen? The Bible even says, if I harbor unforgiveness in my heart, God will not hear me. Amen. Amen? Amen? If I harbor unforgiveness in my heart, God will not forgive me. We're going to put this on the altar today. Amen? Amen. We're going to put it on the altar today. Let's see, let's, let's see what else we got hidden in our tents. Man, I'm telling you, there's not a lot of room in here. Oh, yeah. Ooh, I'll come back to that one. Yeah, this one. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. (laughs) 
I better move on to the next one. <laughs> How many times have we held on to this in our tent? But Brother Jason, it's the truth. Say these two words with me. Shut up. <laughs> if it's not wholesome, if it's not positive, if it's not building up, shut up. Amen? Amen. Man, I tell you, that Aaron Richard, Keith, I love that guy, man. I love him. But man, I'm going to be honest, I think my dog could greet better than he does. I love him, though. I love him. See, we try to justify our gossip by putting a positive in the narrative. I love him. But maybe he should be a janitor. Come on, somebody. I'm saying it out of love. How many times do we hold on to these things and it's like a cancer seeping through the body, causing divisions, causing chasms, causing, causing strife because we hold on to these things. And you know what? Sad church, a lot of times we don't even realize we're doing it. And you know, another sad thing, we were just talking about this behind. I was sitting there shutting up back there before church because I'm telling you, we were talking and Keith was sharing scripture. And I'm like, y'all are just all over my sermon. But you know, Christians are the only ones that eat and devour one another. Through our words. Through our words. Do you know what church, that church so-and-so down there? I thought we were on the same team. Churches talking about one another. Christians talking about one another. Pastors talking about one another. We're on the same team. But that's exactly what the enemy does. If he can find a little wedge, he'll stick his foot in there. And, and, and Keith and I, we were just talking about it. Somebody might come into church one day, and they might, have, they might have had a bad day. They might not be feeling well. But they come in, and they don't say hi to me. Oh, that person, they're so stuck up. They're, they got such pride in their life. I hope God gets them. But all we were doing was gossiping. They were just having a bad day. Look at your neighbor say, get your feelings off your sleeve. And get the gossip out. Amen? Amen. Let's put it on the altar. Let's put it on the altar. Luke chapter 6 verse 45. Luke 6 45. A good man out of the good measure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Mic drop, boom. How can bitter water and sweet water come out of the same well? Amen? Whatever's in our heart is going to come out of our mouth. Get the gossip out. Amen. This, this might be the last time I ever preach, but I'm going to enjoy it. It's destructive. It's never positive. It sinks our te its teeth into our hearts, our souls, our minds, and it corrupts us like a fast-spreading cancer. We're going to put it on the altar. Let's let's see let's see what else we got. I, 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 oh oh yeah. Let, let me. This one should be easy to find. Let me see here. Oh yeah, this one's big. Let's see here. Oh yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Sex is used to sell everything from cars to copying machines in our society that we live in today. Amen? Amen. You can't turn on the TV without seeing somebody clantly dressed 
the victorious secret uh, whatever they are. Oh, it is a soft core porn, and you're sitting there watching it. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You can't even hardly come to church anymore without somebody dressing like it's the club. We leave very little to the imagination these days and age. Right? Don't even get me started on yoga pants. Back in the day, I got my parents here. I'm embarrassing them. This is the kind of preaching I was raised on. Some people call it clothesline preaching, but I think we need holiness back in the house of God. Amen? The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. How are people going to know you're a child of God if you act like them and dress like them and talk like them and look like them? Come on, somebody. But I remember back in the day, my grandmother was pregnant with my aunt. This was back in the 60s. And it was taboo to even say the word pregnant. Right? One day, she just shows up with a baby. Nobody even knew she was pregnant. Right? Right? Because that was the day and age. You didn't talk about that kind of stuff. Right? You, talk, you, you turn on the TV, they always had two twin beds, right? <laughs> yeah, they put those babies together. <laughs> they always had the two twin beds. They never showed anybody in bed together. Do you know the very first TV show to show a couple in bed together was the Flintstones? That goes to show you the power that media has over your children. Hello, somebody. And, and, and how if we turned into a society where now it's even acceptable to drop F-bombs on national television during prime time? Come on, somebody. We're living in a desensitized society. 30, 40 years ago, if they had saw what's on TV today and what we're taking part in today, they would, I'm telling you, they would lose their ever-loving mind. Come on. I remember my grandma said, those girls just can't wait till it's warm so they can show off their legs. <laughs> right? But I believe that, and here's the thing, guys. Holiness is not the length of your dress. Holiness is not the length of your hair. Holiness is a heart thing. The Bible says that without holiness, no man shall see God. God is holy. He's absolutely powerful because he's absolutely holy. Holiness is power. Somebody say yes. yes. We're going to get the lust out. We're going to get the lust out. The online porn industry makes $3,000 per second. $3,000 Per second, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. Three thousand. The average age that someone is introduced to porn is eleven years old. What are your kids looking at? Come on, parents. My my kids don't stand a chance. My daughter has an iPad. And I'm gonna tell on you, baby. I'm sorry. She, uh, she has an iPad, has a password to keep her brother out. Well, she decided one day to change that password. Mama tried getting on the iPad, couldn't get in. She gets her phone out, calls the teacher, calls her up, says, I can't get in Addison's iPad. She said, hold on. Gets Addison out of class, hands her the phone, says, it's your mama. <laughs> we ain't got no secrets in our house. Come on, somebody. What are your kids watching? What are your kids looking at? Come on. Our marriages are falling apart because we put unrealistic expectations from what we see on television. Well, honey, why can't you do that? I see them doing it on TV. So I'm talking real, guys. We got to get the lust out. We got to get the works of the flesh out. 
We are held in bondage. God told us to crucify our flesh. And we spend so much time puffing up and primping up and pinning up what God told us to crucify. Amen? We got to get the lust out. We got to get the lust out. The 12 to set here, Christian, the 12 to 17 age group is one of the highest consumers of internet porn. 12 to 17 year olds. We got our work cut out for us. Job chapter 31. Job chapter 31, verse 1. I made a solemn pact with myself never to undress a girl with my eyes. So, what can I expect from God? What do I deserve from God Almighty above? Isn't calamity reserved for the wicked? Isn't disaster supposed to strike those who do wrong? Isn't God looking, observing how I live? Doesn't he mark every step that I take? Amen? God is watching. You know, you know the, the, the thing about lust is that it's secret. You could take a drug test and we'll find out if you've been smoking and toking. You could take a breathalyzer and we'll find out what your point count is, right? But there is no test for this. My wife has a, a family member. Her husband was helpless. I went to Bible college with him. Was helplessly and hopelessly addicted to pornography. Was living a second alternate lifestyle. Was going to strip clubs was getting on phone chats, was doing all these different things. His wife had no idea. So very successful, beautiful family. And one day he said, I've had enough. Enough is enough. Some of y'all in this church today need to say enough is enough. So he went to his wife, confessed everything. And now, how often does he do it? Every six months, he will go take a polygraph test to prove that he's clean. Amen. That's freedom. When you want it bad enough that you're willing to do that, that is freedom. Hallelujah. God wants us to be free. I'm just going to say it. You don't hear this a lot in church, but sex is a gift from God. Amen. Amen. But here's the thing, just like a campfire, is when it's kept inside the ring, is a beautiful thing to look at and to experience, but outside of that ring, it is destructive and it will kill you. Amen? Amen. I, I, Mandy and I were at a marriage conference a couple of years ago. And uh, the, one of the, the gentlemen that spoke, him and his wife, he was the, Chris, he was the uh, chaplain for the Detroit Lions football team. He traveled with them everywhere they went. He was with them at every game. He prayed over them before every game. He was like a brother to them, chaplain of the Detroit Lions. And he said, whenever I'm at a game, I have a pass that I, I wear around my neck. It has my picture and it has my name. And under my name, it says all access all access and he said with that pass I can get into any room I want to get into I can go anywhere that I want to go inside of that stadium no questions asked and he told us he said men you need to have at least two other brothers that you can give an all access pass to they can go into any room of your life they can ask you any question that they want to ask you. Because the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Amen? Amen? We've got a men's retreat coming up, men. You think it's rough in here today. Well, we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty. Y'all need to get signed up for that men's retreat. Amen? Amen? All access. Well, let, let's, well, we're going to definitely put this one on the altar. I'm going to put it on the altar, and we're going to keep it there. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's, get, let's, hmm. let's see what else we got hidden in our tent. Let's see here. Ooh. Ushers, 
lock the doors. <laughs> Miss Monica, I'm telling you, sis, you could have preached where you at. You could have preached my sermon. Hello, somebody. Amen. God has blessed us to be a blessing. Amen. Let's look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Everybody repeat after me. Everything I have is because of God. Everything I have is because of God. I know you went to school and you earned that degree, but everything you have is because of God. I know you have that job that God's blessed you with. You have that business that you built from the ground up with your own grit and sweat and tears, but God is the one who gave you the ability. Amen? Amen. Amen. Who, who has a dollar? Can somebody give me a dollar? How if you got a dollar? A dollar. One dollar. Would you all give them in the offering? <laughs> Debit card? <laughs> Thank you, Brother Bob. Everybody give Brother Bob a hand. <laughs> Where's it at? Here we go. In God we trust. Raise your hand if you trust God for your family. Amen? Raise your hand if you trust God for your health. Raise your hand if you trust God for your eternal salvation. All right, put your hand down. I believe God's saying, if you trust me with such big things, why can't you trust me with such little things? Hello, somebody. Amen? But I know, God, you gave me 90, but I want your 10, too. Hello? Hello? I'm so broke because I live so far above my pay and I live so far above my means that, God, I'm sorry, but I've got to have my 90 and your 10 too. I know you've blessed me with my job, Lord, but I deserve it. I owe everybody in the world. In fact, I sing every morning. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Hello? Hello? We live so far above our means. God, come on, he's given us wisdom. He's given us wisdom. Everything that he's given us has come from him. So why can't we give what he deserves back, amen? Notice in the, in the story I just read to you about Je uh, um, um, Jericho. Jericho was the first city they came across, right? Right? And what did God command Joshua? He said, everything in the city of Jericho, it's mine. Don't touch it. Right? And notice that Achan touched what God had put his hand on. And what happened? It brought death. What God has designed to bless you will curse you. Amen? Malachi. Let's go to Malachi. Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi. Will a man rob God? My dad had a very good pastor friend that uh, a pastor to church. One, this was up in Michigan. It's cold, snowy. He walked in church one Sunday. Brother Todd had his overcoat on. Preached with his overcoat on. I mean, his overcoat, you, I mean, it's odd. And somebody asked him after church, 
I said, brother, why'd you preach with your overcoat on? And he said, well, in Malachi it says, will a man rob God? If people will rob God of his, I'm afraid somebody's going to steal my coat. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> Amen. God has blessed us. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, says God, because you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Verse number nine. You are cursed with a curse. You ever feel like you're putting your money in bags with holes in it? It seems like you, I mean, it gets deposited and it's like a black hole. Where did it go? Where did it go? Oh, I guess I'm the only one that feels like that. All right. Where did it go? Right? Because here's the thing. Just like what Miss Monica said, when we put God first, everything else will be added unto us. He wants to bless us, but what we use is supposed to be a blessing. We turn into a curse. Amen? I feel like I'm losing you. Are you all still with me this morning? Okay. You're cursed with a curse because you haven't put God first in every area. And somebody say every area. every area. Put him first in every area of your life. Verse number, verse number 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. That's why we give so we can be a blessing. Amen? Bring all the tithes in so we can send it out and be a blessing. Be a blessing. Amen? Why are we able to help Teen Challenge of the Upper Cumberland? Because people are faithful in giving. Why are we able to go into the projects and feed people a meal and love on them and show them Jesus? Because people are obedient to the Word of God. Amen? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now. This is the only time in the Bible where God says, the old King James says, prove me. Amen. Brother David, that's the only time in the Bible where God gives us a challenge. He said, you know what? You think you got it all figured out? Try me. Try me. And try me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive. I don't know about you, church, but I want more than enough. I want more than enough because there's somebody out there that doesn't have enough. And I want to give through, I want God to give through me, not to me. Amen. What if, what if you were able to help some single mother and pay up her electric bill for the rest of the year? What if, what if you were able to gift a car to a family that's in need? No strings attached. Come on. God wants you to be a blessing, but he can only bless us when we put him first. Amen? Amen. He said, I'll give you barns that you didn't build. I'll give you fields that you didn't sow. He said, you'll be the first and not the last. You'll be above and not beneath if we put him first in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's put it on the altar this morning. Let's trust God. I believe there's one more in here. Let me, let me see what we got. I think, oh, we still got more that we could talk about, but I, I'm going to. I think this will be the last one. Is anybody getting anything out of this today? Amen. Amen. How many times have we been hurt? How many times have we been hurt but we hide it? We put it in our tent. Oh, we put our church face on. And we come in and everybody says, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. But we've got wounds that we're hiding in our tent. Just like an animal that's been hurt, it runs and hides. 
And that's exactly what we were talking about this morning. That's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He wants to peel us off from the group. He wants to take us away from the pack because if he can isolate us, he can annihilate us. Amen? And how many times do we hide our wounds? It may be a wound from a divorce. You may have been molested as a child. You may have been hurt in a church. I don't know what your wounds are, but we all experience them at one time or another. And God is saying, don't hide it. Don't cover it up. I want you to bring it to me. The book of Psalm. The book of Psalm. What does it say? The book of Psalm chapter 147. He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up our wounds. Amen? Don't hide it in your tent. Bring it out. Bring it out for everybody to see. It's time that we get open with God. It's time that get, we get real with each other. Amen? Amen? Do you notice that when God spoke to Joshua and said Achan had sinned, he had touched the sanctified thing. Do you notice that God did not say Achan sinned? God said Israel has sinned. Did you catch that? Why? Because when he looks down, he sees one body. Not many bodies, not individuals. He sees one body. The body of Christ. And when our body in our natural form is wounded, it will redirect its energy and its cells to that one damaged area to repair it. Amen? And that's exactly the way we are supposed to be in the body of Christ. Don't hide your wounds anymore. Bring them out in the open. Get it out of your tent. Everybody's standing with me today. What's hidden in your tent today? What's, what have you been hiding in the recesses of your heart? Whatever it is today, I don't know if it's greed or if it's lust or gr maybe you hold a grudge or maybe you struggle with gossip or maybe you've been wounded. I don't know what it is today. But here's the thing. In the scripture, in the, in the story that I read to you about Achan, unfortunately the Bible says that he was put to death because of his sin. That was Old Testament. Here's the good news today. Jesus took our infirmity. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. And if you're holding on to sin today, if you've got something in your tent today, the good news, my brother and my sister, is Jesus is here to forgive you of every single sin. Can I hear an amen? amen? Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you have never trusted Him before as your Savior, there's no better day than today to trust Him and to put your life in his hands. Jesus, I heard somebody say, Jesus wants you to be an organ donor. He wants you to give him your heart. Amen. If you've never given him your heart, if you've never trusted him as your Savior, today, the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is promised to no man. Today, your soul, today will be required of you. If you were to close your eyes, if you weren't to make it home today, if you were to die before you reached your driveway, where would you go this morning? Would you go to a godless hell, forever separated from his presence? Would you go to hell, or would you enter in immediately into the presence of Jesus in heaven the only way the Bible says that we are to go to the Father is through Jesus Christ if you've not accepted him today I want you to raise your hand nobody's looking around except for me I want to see your hand if you've never there's one thank you Jesus is there anybody else 
Don't leave this place today without the assurance of knowing that you're on your way to heaven. Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? Come on. There's one. Thank you, Jesus. There's another one. Hallelujah. Is there another? Today is the day of salvation. Don't leave this place without knowing that your life is in the hands of the maker of heaven and earth. You've tried it on your own. And look at where that's gotten you. Put your hands, put your heart in the hands of Jesus today. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? There's another. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Saints, I need you praying. God is doing something in this place today. I need you praying, saints. Is there another? Is there another? Today is the day. Today is the day. Hallelujah. Is there another? Hallelujah. If you raised your hand this morning, just like what I was talking about, it's time to take those sins out of the hidden place, out of your tent, and it's time to come to the light. Amen. If you raised your hand this morning, I want you to come and meet me at this, this altar. Let's come down here and let's talk to Jesus. Come on. There was three of you. I'm expecting three of you to come down. Come on. I'm going to come pray with you. Come on now. Come on now. Come on, baby. Come on now. Where's that other one? Come on. Oh, 